You there, we're assaulting. Don't be a coward, push off. Sir, they're shooting at us a, a hell full of bullets, sir. Nonsense, we're pushing on. Oh, bugger, we just lost our commanding officer. Oh, Nigel, Nigel, the commander's dead. No, dead, not dead. This round is called the 303 British round. It's called 303 because that's how much it costs to shoot each one of these rounds is $3.03. .03. Hello there, Jack. You found yourself in Tunisia, did you? Well, don't be afraid. Now these people here, the name the Jerry's. They have what's called a car 98K. Our fathers fought against it in the Great War. But the Jerry's have learned a thing or two since the trenches of France. So now we're going to teach you how to fight them in North Africa. Bayonets. Great for stabbing and getting up close and personal. Also great for checking for snakes in your fighting hole. No snake there, but just some strange box with an Amazon logo. Years ahead of its time. I don't know what that's about. Another thing bayonets are great for, picking up litter around the flat range. Did you hear that? That's an MG42. It's bogs worse than its bite. So don't be afraid to push the objective and work on through it. Daddy ho lads, let's take that machine gun out. Ha! Remember, the element of surprise in a wide open terrain such as the desert, using any sort of feature to conceal yourself will be the difference between life and death. Ungod! The thing about North Africa, all your equipment gets hot. So try and find a piece of shade wherever you can. But keep in mind, Jerry is also looking for shade too. So, god damn, everything's hot. What, what, what pisses me off is that people are disrespecting people by not accurately doing uh, kits that they see online. Like, if you watch History Channel in H uh, World War II in HD, people have very obvious kits and things they do. People die. They fought in those kits, and we just like put on some green scrubs and run around on on our backyards and take pictures with our iPhones. And and the kit doesn't represent the valor that these men fought with. It doesn't represent anything accurately. It doesn't represent anything but your IQ level being below 70, which is still above the American average, which clearly indicates why people can't do proper kits. I, I can't, I can't bro. Yeah, dude, I couldn't imagine that. Dude, I hate when people get all farby and don't actually pay attention to detail and do it properly, historically accurate <laughs> kit, right? All right, bro, I know you're on the toilet. I know you're watching this, eating your tea and crumpets, thinking about Tuesday, uh, uh, British stuff. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe. Ring the notification bell. Smashing, isn't it, bruv? I gotta stop doing these British characters, dude. What the hell? Oh, 
Hey, I didn't see you there. Gentlemen, real quick, we gotta thank the sponsors for this episode because it was expensive to shoot this mug. So big thank you to LAS Concealment. LAS is an excellent option for concealing a firearm close to your person. The gun on you is worth 10 guns in the safe in a time of crisis. So head on over to LAS, check them out. Link in the description down below. They have one of my favorite people ever. They have his holster, Brandon Herrera's holster. So of course, go check it out. But they crush the holster game. Gentlemen, and welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, Nigel Bennington of the Queen's Royal Dragoons. Now I'm just messing with you. Hey, it's me, Admin. <laughs> Bet you didn't recognize me. Uh, anyway, gentlemen, today we're going over the infield number four, Mark One. I have weirdly gotten a lot of requests for an infield video, and I know there is a plethora and different variety of infields on the market that you can get. And understand that this won't be the only infield video we do, unless you, of course, all hate it, then I'll just take my cue and exit stage right. But if not, then we'll actually do a little bit more infield series like the SMLE and the Jungle Carbine. But for the first one, I figure we, we touch on a World War II era. Uh, and well, I guess technically any infield is a World War II era infield. When it was made, World War II. I, we're getting the weird technicalities off the bat. Before we dive into the gun, let's talk about the gear real quick because I can already hear you guys seething, seething at this historically accurate, I mean inaccurate kit. But first and foremost, we got our Webley here. I uh, made a quick appearance and I already did a video on it, had some issues with it, but nonetheless, it's still a really cool piece of history and it's probably one of my favorite actions or revolvers because it breaks open from the top. How do you not love that? It's like a fidget spinner for grown men. Too. And it is just very aesthetic. So I'll link that video. You can go watch it. This is a, a Brody helmet. I had to do a little jerry rig with the inside because it's very aged, weathered. So I actually think this is the American version of the helmet. So the Americans pretty much showed up and were like, hey, sick helmet. And they just copied the English homework. And we had like the American Brody. But this, I think, actually was part of my grandpa's helmet. So he served in World War II. He's since passed away. But I believe this is his that he got from the war. I, I don't know if this was like a standard issue one he got at the beginning. Maybe he met a British friend overseas and he got one of their helmets and brought it home as kind of like, hey, check it out. So that's maybe my thought process. And then the webbing. So the webbing, if you're curious, is also historically inaccurate. So this is pattern 58 webbing. This was made in 1958 or from that era of design of 1958. What they actually did have was pattern 1937 webbing. And that was actually pretty cool webbing if you look at it. It's not as aesthetic as I would say the, the World War, like really World War I British soldiers actually look super cool. Like they have this really cool vibe and aesthetic to them. And the outfit. So the outfit's definitely, the, <laughs> I love the shorts with, I you, get, you know I love you guys because I'm rocking socks like these. So I'm going to get a nasty tan line. Oh, wait, hold on. Who do I look like? You know I had to do it to him. I love you guys slash hate you guys sometimes because I always want to do like as hard of a LARP as I can, but sometimes the economics of it just get kind of uh, stringent. I am like that wartime Britain sometimes trying to crank out these awesome LARP videos, but sometimes I am hampered by finances, which leads me to my next topic that I'm always curious about is that why didn't the British having an American ally, an American ally that's as industrious as they were, why don't they just pick up the E1 Garand? Why don't they start using that bad boy? Because listen, I'm gonna be very biased here. I love American World War II weapons. As an American, I love them dear to my heart. All of them are so freaking cool and they are like just outgunning a lot of the other nations at the time that are still stuck using bolt action rifles. The Germans were still using the Car 98K until they came out with the Gewehr 43, right? And then they of course came out with the base SCG 44, but that's neither here nor there, and there's some other variants of assault rifles that came out during that era. So, to be fair, I think the British, and this is kind of like, um, I was doing a little bit of research on this, so I know some of you guys, disclaimer, disclaimer, I know some of you guys are just steely-eyed historical veterans, and you guys are dialed in on your history. You know the intricates, you know the names of the guys that run the factories during World War II. Hey, listen, I'm not that smart. I'm a big chimp running around the flat range, and I'm not even that smart because I'm doing it during the summertime, so I'm kind of an idiot. I think pretty much my hypothesis is that, of course, the British have so much 303 British left over from World War I that logistically, like trying to get 30 out 6 or rechamber M1 Garands would have probably been a logistical nightmare. And then we have so much of our in house knowledge for training already established to where it's like you can crank guys out running an infield. I'm sure it happened, you know, Americans maybe picking up an infield, maybe the British picking up an M1 Garand. I'm sure there was a little cross pollination of kit where they're like, you know, I'll try this out. But it's, you know, it's not like a mainstay thing. It's not like a really general broad acceptance of history. This isn't Battlefield 5, right? There are like historical rules we have to play by. You can't just willy-nilly your own kit like however you want. So if they dropped me off back in time and I was in the UK and they're like, all right, my hazy infield, let's say, hey, hold on, hey, quick question. 
Uh, one, I don't have a British accent. Two, where can I get anything else besides a bolt gun if I'm gonna go fight this conflict? Because it's still, and I say this every time, I said it in the Mosin video. I said it in the Car 98K video. I think I even said it in the M1 Grand video. It blows my mind that they are fighting this conflict. Nobody has body armor but they're using these hunting caliber rounds for people that are essentially soft target, which is wild. It's like pretty much dudes are running around wearing this, you know, there's no body armor going on whatsoever. And I was talking to my good buddy Grantham, because we were at that airsoft event not too long ago. We were talking about this and I, he brought up a really good point that essentially the, the thinking and thought process of the time was they wanted to stop cavalry. They wanted to be able to kill horses pretty quick. Now, he made a good point, and I'm not sure how factual it is, but I'm willing to trust him on this one, because when you really think about it and dive into it, it makes a lot of sense. Now, not for the era of World War II, but if you take it back to pretty much the start of World War I, right? World War I was pretty much the first large-scale modern conflict minus the Boer Wars in South Africa. The Boer Wars are often looked over, and even you know, the Jocko podcast had a really good episode on the Boer Wars and the lessons learned, and then the lessons forgotten of how it transitioned back into World War I. Have to think about the, the, the time of the leadership, at least at the Boer Wars, right? Or even at the World War I. Those guys, you know, the leadership there in that era, in 1914 Europe, those guys maybe in their 50s and 60s, you go back 50 to 60 years when they're first being kids, Cavalry is still a huge issue on the battlefield. 50 years before World War I was what? What, Joe? 1860, the Civil War, when cavalry was still a factor riding around, influencing the way the battlefield was done. So when these modern cartridges were coming around, you had to think, okay, now can the average general infantry defeat a cavalry charge just like that? Yes, pretty much now, is, these are gonna zip right into a horse and take it down. And a horse is a nice, big, easy target. I know I'm getting on like a historical wargaming uh, rant, but this is all kind of stuff I think about because at the end of the day, what's going on is you're having these young guys go out and fight and die. And one thing they're using is a bolt gun, you know? Minus the Americans, right? We're looking at different factions right now, but the Americans did start with the Springfield rifle, right? It's a very visceral thing that connects us to a very violent conflict. It's just really cool is that a part of history and a part of American culture is that we get to own guns. And these guns connect us directly with those guys that were there fighting. We get to essentially kind of see what it would have been like to use this gun. Now, we're, I'm not getting zipped at by an MG42, thankfully, which would be terrifying. The gun itself. So there's also a litany of YouTubers that have already gone over the infield number four Mark I already. Quick shout outs, you know, Forgotten Weapons, Nine Hole Reviews, and of course, British Muzzle Loaders. And other guys, of course, I'm probably missing you, but hey, this is just, I'm, I'm getting cooked by the sun, my brain's already frying. This wasn't crazy expensive, it's, I think I bought it for around 500 bucks. So it's a very affordable rifle, minus the 303 British ammunition. So this was very expensive to shoot and buy, so if you're someone looking to, hey, I wanna get a military surplus rifle, Usually, most of the time now, the most expensive part is going to be stockpile on ammo. A big downside, and it's very sad. Damn, dude. Smacks that steel like it owes it money. 303 British is a pretty cool round, so it's another rimmed cartridge. So if we look at it and compare it to 762x54R, we see the little comparisons, right? This is 762x54R. This is 303 British. Both got rimmed casings at the bottom, which I believe, I'm not an expert on this, but this does pose uh, issues for extraction at least within like semi-auto guns. Let's compare it actually to its, uh, its adversary. Let's compare it to its adversary. So we have eight millimeter Mauser versus 303 British. Eight millimeter Mauser looks like it just goes so hard. Look at the different sizes of that bad boy. Terrifying stuff. It's terrifying not only were these random bolt guns, but they literally had belt feds hooked up to it. You know, you had the Vickers gun, you had MG42s, you had the Bren gun. I would actually love to get a Bren gun on the channel. I think Bren guns are super cool and it's it straight up vibe. Enfield. Let me do that. Our beloved Card 98. The Card 98 is probably one of my favorite World War II, if not my favorite World War II bolt gun. Dang. That thing sends them. And then we got the Mosin. The Mosin is, of all the military surplus rifles, this is going to be one of the most affordable, of course. It's oftentimes a lot of guys' uh, first gun. Good God, man, these things are send them. Real quick, you guys always bring this up when I bring out the Car 98K about the, sw uh, the sling swivel being on the wrong side. So if you haven't watched the video, go watch it. But this is essentially how I got it. This is how my dad got it. My dad had a friend that served in the Airborne during World War II. So I believe this was a battlefield pickup because it has all matching original parts. So I am not gonna be the one to move it around from how I got it. I don't care it's on the, the wrong side, deal with it. <laughs> 
we're essentially speed running through it, doing a little compare and contrast. I will say that the the Car 98K is going to be my favorite bolt gun from World War II, just because I think it shoots the best. It sounds very fantastic, and it has that sweet space kraut magic vibe. The problem is, it, I don't think it uh, is the best due to the fact that it doesn't have a detachable box magazine that holds 10 rounds of 303 British. I think my ball claw was crooked. There we go. Gotta have a nice straight ball claw. In Britain during World War II, logistically, probably would have had a much easier time making these stripper clips to use for their guns as opposed to making a bunch of box magazines, as opposed to carrying a bunch of box magazines too. So it probably makes a lot more sense that a lot of guys would have been running uh, maybe just one box magazine. Maybe they had a spare box magazine. You know, I probably should have done more research for this part, but I'm assuming they probably had a spare or two. And then for the most part, they would probably enjoyed just having stripper clips. I'm assuming like, hey, you, just, you grab your bandolier, and you just throw it on or throw it in your pouch. You, you'd have multiple bandoliers for fighting and sustained fighting because he who has the most ammo usually wins a gunfight. So really interesting fact. Now let's cover the bayonet real quick. So the bayonet ungod, really got dumbed down as far as bayonets go. It's not like a, a classical bayonet you see, which makes sense because if you're trying to poke somebody, I guess all you really need is a poker, right? It reminds me of like a medieval prick, which is actual terminology. But you got to think, I mean, Pretty basic. It's a far cry from the bayonets of old. And I got one I can show you. That's I use on the Mosin. Now we got this nasty looking Mosin bayonet. And how it compares to this Enfield bayonet is look how much longer that thing is. Good God, man. I think it'll go skewer someone's like a spear. Not only is the Mosin longer overall, but look at that bayonet. Good God. What's crazy a thought to me is like when these soldiers started getting into cities and they had to like do close quarter combat with these freaking bayonets or with these bolt guns and just how wild of a time that would have been like, all right, let's go clear around this corner. He's like, Ew. so that's pretty gnarly. That's, that's where I'd be like, hey, give me a shotgun or a sub gun. That thing would just reign supreme. Minus the hunting caliber rounds is probably devastating walls. You're like hiding behind your wall. You're like, I'm safe. And all of a sudden this collapses and becomes like five dudes with modes and just shot your wall. Yet again, referencing the British Muzzle Loader channel, they essentially got cruder and cruder as they went on. No longer like the, the days of the elegant bayonet, but essentially just like, hey, we need a poker you can throw on the end of your barrel. So overall, I would say I'm, I'm impressed by the performance of this gun, the peep sights, the quick like close up uh, rapid sight of this bad boy, the safety mechanism, and of course the box magazine, all in all to me make for a pretty, as advanced as you can make a bolt gun for modern combat of that era. It's like literally Britain's entering using still World War I tech, and then at the end of it, Germany has you know 30 round assault rifles in the form of the SCG-44. Russia's working on making the AK-47. It's it's all this crazy stuff coming out of this conflict, which is kind of like the crucible of fire that just forges nations into making the most murderous tools they can. So pretty gnarly, and it's definitely cool to see how far we've come. Now this thing, of course, had a good service life, uh, being made in the you know during World War II. I'm saying started in 1943. So technically, I guess with it being 1944, I don't think it would have saw any action. This one would have saw any action in uh, Tunisia. It would go on to have a service life all the way up to what the Falklands, I want to say, where they had like uh, different versions of a sniper variant of it. So I saw some legs and I can see these guys also uh, being passed around and being used within the British interest colonies. You know, the colonies were starting to fade away after World War II, but anywhere that was kind of owned by the Brits, I can see these showing up too. So. Makes a lot of sense. All right, I've ranted enough about these World War II rifles. We've got to get you guys out of here. I'm also cooking. Gentlemen, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you like and subscribe. Leave a comment in the comment section down below. Your comments are a sacrifice to the Queen's Majesty. God, I hate that I said that. If you want to support the channel in any way, shape, or form, Patreon is an excellent way to support the channel. I have a Discord in there. We stay up late, talk about girls. I try and play video games with them, but then I get distracted by real life. There might be a few feds in there, so just be careful. It's a joke to the ATF agent watching this. Merchandise, merchandise is also an excellent way to support the channel. Rock some admin gear. Let the girls know that you are not a turbo version. Attract a mate, procreate, and make your mother proud. Gentlemen, stay easy, stay breezy. I'm gonna catch you on the flip. Heretica! Expecto Patronum! That's what the bayonet reminds me of, like a Harry Potter. I don't know why the British just love like long pointy things. There's like, well, check it out, got me prick. I don't even like Harry Potter. I miss the good old days when we used to like burn the witches and like wizards at the stake, dude. Harry Potter's weak ass. The American exchange student at Hogwarts would have just crushed that final battle, dude.
Hakigadi! Harry Potter! The boy! I can't, I don't even know my Harry Potter reference. I'm trying too hard, dude. My wife might like that one though. She's a Harry Potter fanatic.